PowerPoint presentation. So <clears throat> TelFed is our nickname, Tel Aviv Federation. It uh, comes from uh, our days in 1948, when we looked after the 800 Machal soldiers who came to volunteer in the War of Independence. And our official name, South African Zionist Federation Israel, we still bear with pride from those days, but we no longer connected in any official way to the Zionist Federation in South Africa. But uh, that, that's our history, right? And it goes back to 1948. So, but everyone calls us Telfed from Tel Aviv Federation, even though we're now in Ranana, and we didn't change our name to, to Ranfed, stayed at Telfed, and uh, it's a name we like using. We look at our mission, our mission is to promote the quality of life of Southern Africans and Australians in Israel. There's a special quality of life that you can only get in Israel, being a Jew in the Jewish homeland. We want our Olim to be able to experience that. And we want them to participate and contribute to Israeli society. We're not there to keep our Olim in a bubble, but uh, as soon as possible to become active and contributing members to Israel. And the last slide, relates to the different departments at Telfed. So each square is a department with a, with a staff member. And you can see there's two pillars that Telfed uh, work on. Those pillars are Klita and social welfare. Those are the two aspects that we deal with. So if we look at Klita, you can see the first block on your screen on the right-hand side. Last year, we had 326 Olim from South Africa uh, the whole year. And now already at the end of August, we've passed that number. So perhaps by the end of 2021, we'll hit the 500 number, which will be the largest number of Olim since the 1970s. Um, we helped also with absorption of Australian Olim and also Olim from England. There we have the uh, volunteers together with the uh, Itakut Ole Britannia and we have regional volunteers that help the Olim from England with their absorption. What's our aim? Our aim is to help you to help yourself, that's what Telfit is there for, to give advice and guidance and to steer the Olim in the correct direction so they can help themselves. Right? We're not here to do the Kita work for the Olim, we're here to give them the ability to help themselves so that they can do the steps that they need. Uh, you can see a special department there helping the lone soldiers, 170 lone soldiers. The main assistance we give is actually when they finish the army, and they need to adapt to Israeli civilian life, sign a contract with an Israeli landlord, etc. So there's a lot of help there, specifically after the army, but certainly also before and during as well. We have 250 volunteers at Telfed. You guys are welcome also to be in touch if you'd like to volunteer. It's uh, regional volunteers, 24 regional committees throughout the country, and regional volunteers that help the Olim to be absorbed in their region and before the Olim make Aliyah to give them important information about those regions before they come and live in Israel. Uh, we also have uh, volunteers that teach English to the Ethiopian or Le community. Our employment department, we have tonight Yael and Michal, right, it's counseling and seminars like we have tonight. And please God, when you guys are successful in your field, You'll become a mentor. We have volunteer mentors who help the new Olim find jobs and uh, help them get into the job market. Uh, if you're not part of our Facebook community, please join uh, Instagram too. There's over 4,000 people on the Facebook community. You know, so it's a lot of good advice coming there from other Olim. If you're not getting our newsletter once a month, please tell your L so she can update your details in the database. And the Telfed magazine, the new one's just come out for Rosh Hashanah. So hopefully you'll get it soon in the post. And if you're not getting the magazine, Rosh Hashanah and Pesach, then please tell Yael. Um, we are the only only organization that provides housing, 105 apartments, at subsidized rentals, well below the market rates. And uh, that's in Tel Aviv and in Ranana. And 70% of the income that we get from the rentals goes to help those that are in need of financial assistance. We have uh, about 70 events a year, more than one a week, about 3,000 participants. And most of the events today are on Zoom, and hopefully soon we can get back into our face-to-face -face events. Uh, but please join us for those events. There's a lovely online community of South Africans and Australians meeting each other at our events online. 
We move over to social welfare. So you can see over 400 scholarships. And actually, today is the last day to apply for the scholarships. So if you know of anyone or if any of you are planning on studying next year and you want to apply, tonight is that before midnight, make sure you get your forms in. Uh, we're the only only organization that, that gives out our scholarships at the Knesset. Uh, PRAS, the students do three hours of community service every week, helping us absorb OLIM. And you guys can also, if you want to either be a student or you can apply for a PRAS student to come and you'll be a client. You can also apply to be a PRAS client and receive a student to help you with your absorption for three hours a week. Scholarships based on financial need and SASI scholarship, which are for those South Africans who haven't yet made Aliyah, but come and study in Israel at the different universities. And the last block there, financial assistance. We provide food cards, making sure people are eating okay, counseling from our social worker. 450 people every month receive financial assistance from Telfed. As I said, a lot of the money from that comes from the rentals paid in our building. And, uh, you know, we hope to, to get people off those lists as quickly as possible and back into the workforce. So that is uh, Telfed in a nutshell. Um, I would like to point out that tomorrow, the 1st of September and the 2nd, we're having an online fundraiser. We aim to, to raise a million shekels, and it's to help the speaking flux of Olim that are coming. And um, already we have 500,000 shekels there from in matched funds. It means every shekel that's donated will be matched. So if you donate tomorrow or the next day, you know, whatever you donate will be doubled. So if you want to give a donation to, a, as you know, a good organization, helping uh, South African and Australian Olim, uh, <coughs> tomorrow and the next day will be a good day to do so because your donation will be doubled. So thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, once again, uh, Yael and Michal and our contributors to this evening's uh, webinar. And uh, hopefully have a fruitful time together and good luck to you all in getting your dream job uh, in Israel. Once you do, please let Yael and Michal know that we know of your great achievements. Tadaraba, Shana Tova, a good new year, a new year of good employment and good health for you all. Shalom betoda. Thank you very much, Doron. So uh, I'd like to start the evening. Uh, welcome all of you who have joined us for our webinar on content writing. Um, I would like to hand over uh, the baton to Michal Merten, our career counselor. I'm sure all of you have met Michal at quite a few webinars that she has given in the last uh, year or so. We have with us two guests today, two content writers, Ilana Schaap and Eloise Humer. Ilana is a freelance content writer and Eloise is an uh, employed uh, content writer. And uh, Michal, please. Uh, sorry, 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 I want to ask, I want to ask everybody to please keep uh, your microphones muted and you are invited to open uh, your cameras. Thank you. It'd be lovely to uh, match your name to your face. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce Ilana Schapp and Elo Kumo. Um, Ilana grew up in Cape Town, South Africa. She made LEI in 1991, shortly after completing a master's degree in international newspaper journalism at City University, London. For the next 20 years, she worked as a journalist and editor of newspapers and publications in Israel and abroad. Um, and she switched to content writing four years ago and freelancers for high-tech startups in diverse fields. Um, these range from medical devices to agri-tech, AI, and smart plumbing. And um, she's excited and proud to be a part of marketing cutting-edge Israeli technology innovation to the world. Um, Ilana, would you like to say a few more words before we continue? Um, is this my presentation now? So what you need. Okay. So um, chances are, if you're a native English speaker, when you arrive in Israel and you tell people you, you want to find a change your profession or find a job, 
they'll say to you, why don't you become a content writer? And um, I understand why people would say this, because if you look at the job pages on Facebook, every third job um, offered is for a content writing position. So the jobs are out there. And um, also, if you look at fields, well, I came from journalism. I decided to quit after I wrote, I was asked to write a column on street style for the Jerusalem Post. And my photographer and I were paid the princely sum of 800 shekels, which we had to divide uh, between the two of us. And I realized that this was now kind of uh, embarrassing. And uh, so together with the fact that these content writing jobs were advertised, I knew that they were better, going to be better paid than, than journalism for sure. Um, so the question is, uh, how do you become a content writer if you haven't studied marketing and communications at university, which I wish I could have done, but that isn't the case at this age. And um, so the first thing that I would do is do a, a course in, well, content writing is marketing writing, really. And I would do a course on Udemy or one of these online platforms where you can learn what a content writer does, which is what I did. And also um, look up marketing blog writers like Neil Patel, who can give you so much background and inspiration and understanding of marketing. So I had writing ability, but I had absolutely zero background in marketing. And also my writing ability was for journalistic pieces, it wasn't marketing writing. Marketing writing, um, they always say, remember the word kiss, keep it short and sweet. Um, so you've got to be very succinct and you've got to get your message across because there is so much content out of, out there and you want to get your, uh, audience to go down the marketing funnel. You want to get them either to buy something or to sign up for something. And, uh, you have to really understand, um, marketing marketing so that you can write uh, content correctly. And the next thing you need to do is how you get your marketing portfolio, because when you apply for these jobs that are advertised on Facebook, you're going to have to send them some writing samples, normally two or three. Now, I do know someone who sent in her blog on her Aliyah experience to a company and she got an in-house position based on this blog. Um, but obviously it's preferable if you have marketing writing samples. Sometimes companies ask you to do a writing sample and on one hand, they can exploit you because they can use what you've written and without paying you. On the other hand, you might have a nice sample piece that you could then put in your portfolio. So you have to have a portfolio. The next step is get your LinkedIn profile up and running as a content writer. And what you really have to emphasize is that you're a native English speaker. Um, the next point is to decide whether you want to be freelance or in like me or in-house like Eloise. And basically the difficulty here with being a freelance writer, especially somebody who's starting out, is that you, you, you get assigned some work and then you've got no one to bounce ideas off. You're basically on your own. And this is where the great Google comes in because you can basically Google and research anything. The first time I was asked to write an executive summary, I had no idea what an executive summary was. So I Googled it. Likewise for a white paper, 
no idea what a white paper was. It's a, it's a fairly long article. Um, so I just Googled it and stumbled along. Um, the next question I guess a lot of you have is, can I support myself being a freelancer? Um, it's difficult. And what you should, I guess, aim to do is get some constant clientele um, so that you know you're going to be fed work and or put them on a, get them to put you on a retainer so that you have a monthly salary. But that's really not what I've managed to um, achieve. I'm really freelance. But, but then on the other hand, it suits my lifestyle. And how much time, Michal? Um, we actually wanted to, I, I thought you were just going to present yourself and then we'll go on to the questions. Oh, no. That's um, <laughs> so, so, should we let maybe Eloise um, introduce, I'll introduce her and then we'll go on to the questions and then oh, okay. if you want to add anything else. Is that all right? Yeah, fine. Okay, okay thank you. Um, so... I'd like to introduce Eloise. Eloise was born in South Africa and studied law at UCT. She made Aliyah in 2015 and after a short while found her way into content writing. And she's going to tell us today about her journey to becoming a copywriter. So Eloise, would you like to say a few words? journey to content writing has been quite different um, to, uh, um, I actually had no intentions of becoming a content writer. Um, as Michal, I came from a legal background and ironically, while working in a law firm, I found that the aspect of the job I enjoyed most was writing um, contracts and affidavits um, and when we made Aliyah I was advised that if I wanted to practice law in Israel I would need to study for another an additional three years um, and it's all in very high level legal Hebrew um, which was more than enough to make me decide there was no way I was <laughs> going to do that and um, my very first job, full-time employed job in Israel was at the Technion in Haifa as the admissions coordinator for the international students. Um, in other words, non-Israeli students who were coming from overseas to study in Israel. And being the only native English speaker in the office at the time, a lot of things that needed to be done for the students that had nothing really to do with the admissions process started falling to me. Um, things like keeping the Facebook page updated, the website updated, uh, sending out email blasts about upcoming events, whatever might be happening on campus, all in English. And I found the more I did it, the more I really enjoyed it. And my whole career in terms of content writing just completely spiraled, snowballed, should I say, from there um, in a good way. I had no professional training in content writing. I had no, at the time, I had no professional certification or education in content writing or related fields. Um, most of what I know almost seven years down the line is what I've learned on the job in various jobs. Um, for me, I think a huge part of the journey was having an open mind and, and a level of adaptability um, with regards to the job market. I didn't come to Israel on, on Aliyah with any serious expectations about what my career would be. I kind of just rolled with it for lack of a better uh, description. And that worked in my favor. Um, tremendously and I've been very happy to learn on the job and the various jobs that I've, I've been fortunate enough to have and um, yeah so that's uh, been my journey in a in a very nice little nutshell up until now um, so yeah thank you. Can you 
Thanks. Um, can you talk a little bit about what your day-to-day -day is like? What does a day in the life of a content writer like yourself works as an in-house content writer for a high-tech company looks like? Look like. Sure. So um, I've I've worked in in various environments. Um, a high-tech company that I was at previously was a very corporate environment, and the um, expectations were extremely high. Um, we I produced on average 2,000 words a day, um, and it was all highly researched um, topics for publication, mainly in international publications. At the time, the company was publishing in Wall Street Journal and Mail and Guardian um, and Forbes. So it was, you know, the pressure was extremely high. The expectations were extremely high. Um, in the morning, I would open up my email and I would have a brief about the topic, the requirements um, for what publication it was so that I knew how to um, adjust my uh, language, so to speak, or my target audience. And then I would have to do a fair amount of research to back up what I was writing. It was often on things I'd never written about before. The expectation was just, you know, here's your topic, educate yourself, write about it. Um, the company I'm at now manages over 35 websites, all uh, mainly with an American audience, um, covering a range of topics. Luckily, while well, there is a huge amount of work to do, we don't work with deadlines, um, which is great. And most of us work from home, which is another thing that's great. We have that flexibility. Um, we work with uh, what is known as a CMS or a content management system. So all content writers have access to it. They can see what their list of upcoming tasks are as well as everybody else's and exchange ideas vertically, uh, sorry, virtually that way and uh, communicate virtually that way. Um, and again, I'll get a topic and, you know, it's it's far more relaxed. The, the whole approach with this company is a lot more relaxed. It's all uh, online publications. So it's more like having a virtual conversation with someone. The language is, is, is more friendly and it's not so uh, formal. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically what my what my day looks like now and what my days have looked like in the past. Um, I have to say I, I like the structure. I like the structure. I think I need. I think I'm the kind of person that needs the structure. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, um, Ilan. It must be different in, for you. I know it was talking about communicating with others and sharing ideas. As a freelancer, you, you're much more on your own. So, what does a day to day look like for you? Well, um, it means. Uh, responding to requests from LinkedIn to uh, um, connect with me, job offers. I normally get on average, uh, can be three or four job offers a week through LinkedIn. Um, they might not all pan out, but LinkedIn has been a big source of work for me. So it's dealing with that. Uh, sending off... Um, um, samples or uh, quotes take up a lot of my time. Uh, each, each project I have to negotiate uh, the rates and decide how I'm going to charge them. Um, and then once a piece of content goes off, then I uh, wait for the, you've got to have no ego and of you know, often and uh, CEOs are going to come in and change everything around. And uh, so work with reviews. When I, when I do a quote, I only give them a limited amount of uh, reviewing that I'm going to do, say, three reviews. Uh, otherwise, you can be exploited and it can go on forever. Um, and then also, so that's what I do, basically follow up new work and deal with writing that I have to do. And it ebbs and flows. Israel works according to the, the Chagim and the holidays and it's, uh, it's not constant. 
right? So do you, do you have to constantly market yourself? Um, less so. I've been quite lucky that I've had some clients that I've had for, say, three or four years. The work gets quite repetitive. You can almost copy paste certain things you've done in the past, um, but then you really know the jargon of the industry and the product and, and you work, I work very well with them. Um, yeah, but it's, it's really variable. And that goes for income too. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so that's something to take into consideration when you freelance. Um, and was, what would you say are the career growth opportunity? Um, where do you start and where can you go to? Um, sorry, did you say where did I start working in Israel? I mean, you start probably whilst as a junior position. And what would be your growth opportunity within the company? Or do you have to find a new job in a, in a different company after a few years? How does that work? I, first of all, that's very dependent on the company. Um, where, I was, uh, where I was previously, we were a staff of almost 100 at the time. So it was fairly large as far as some startups in Israel go. Where I am now, we're a staff of 35. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very different, but often getting into a company, especially a startup, you know, from the ground up expands your opportunities for growth within the company. Um, I think also part of the problem I've encountered personally with content writing in Israel is that a lot of companies have a very loose and haphazard definition of what a content writer is. Um, and what a content writer is supposed to do. Um, some companies have expectations of their content writers also being able to manipulate uh, graphics, create graphics, you know, have a working knowledge of uh, Photoshop, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, other companies just want good solid English text and they have graphic designers that handle the rest. So, it's, it's really difficult to, to answer with any specificity because of the nature of how diverse companies in Israel are. Um, I can say that the scope for growth from my experience is quite large, um, especially if you show a willingness to learn and, and to take on things that you might perceive as being outside of you know, the scope of your job or your job title or the definition of your job. Um, as a result, I've, I've learned a lot on the job. I've, I've learned a lot about graphics. I, I'm very good with graphics now. I've learned how to use multiple different kinds of content management systems, um, social media management systems, all things that have stood me in very good stead for my future career in Israel. Would you recommend that people take, a, a, a you know, Ilana spoke about taking courses in, in, in marketing. Would you recommend that someone take courses in, in Photoshop or graphics or HTML or CSS, anything technical like that? Um, graphics, perhaps. Um, I've noticed more and more of a trend in, in terms of the jobs I've seen advertised in, in high-tech companies in Israel that part of the list of requirements for a content writer or a content creator is a working knowledge of graphics. That doesn't mean that anybody needs to rush out and go and do a three-year graphic design degree. But, um, you know, if you can show that you have a working knowledge of, of, of Photoshop or GIMP or any of those related programs that you can, you can do, you know, run of the mill tasks like obfuscate an image if you need to, or adjust the pixelation of an image if you need to, things like that, I think would definitely um, you know, work in one's favor. Um, I did the Google writing courses, actually. That was, that was something that I did. You can do them online, you can do them for free. Um, and let's be frank, anybody who puts Google on their CV is, <laughs> is already you know, showing um, some sort of uh, skill um, everybody loves google um but yeah like like i said content writing and content creation is so loosely defined that 
I think, you know, to nail it down to any one particular cause would be challenging for me. Um, again, especially because most of what I know and do today is things I've learned on the job and not things I've actually gone out and actively learned um, because I was initially not pursuing a career in content writing, although mm -hmm. I absolutely love it and I'm very glad that I uh, now do. Um, and Udemy, like uh, Ilana said, Udemy is, is amazing. The wealth of courses you can get on Udemy for really next to nothing um, price-wise is phenomenal. And the Israeli high-tech companies seem to love Udemy. So that's always a very good option. Michal, can I say something? Yes, please. So I actually feel very differently to Eloise because uh, I do not want to do anything with graphics. I want to be very specific about uh, what I'm being paid to do um, because I'm not learning on the job. The job, you know, it's my time completely and I want to be paid for what I'm doing. So uh, I don't touch. It's the same for SEO. You have to understand it. You have to be able to implement it. But I am not a specialist in, in SEO. Um, I'm not being paid to be either. So mm -hmm. that's I think your as a freelancer, your 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 contract your with a company has to be very clear. Yes, I think yeah. it's also easier for a freelancer to to be very specific. This is what absolutely do do not do. Well, and in high tech, especially in smaller companies, and that has been my personal experience, especially in the startups, you do everything. You're expected to do much more. When, when mm. you come from the outside as an external specialist or professional. Is the, that problem, yeah. the problem mm -hmm. is I work for startups and then when they get established, then they want the in-house team. So I lose my, my job. Right, that is a they problem with freelance. So then you have to find new ones. And, and what about mm. Hebrew? What has been your experience, what level of Hebrew, if at all, is needed, Ilana? Um, I speak Hebrew fluently and I've worked in Hebrew as a journalist to interview, etc. But I can safely say you don't need any Hebrew as a freelance. And in fact, what you should say to someone who, because sometimes Israelis feel embarrassed with their accents or their Hebrew or they, they go into Hebrew and uh, you can say, well, I'm writing in English. Therefore, I want our conversation. I want to do the research with you in English. And uh, that's very acceptable. And also it's market, the, the language of marketing is, is English. So the people that you work with here, especially when you're marketing to North America, uh, which is mainly what I'm involved with. Um, they want to speak English to you. Yeah. And they have a high level of English, but not a high level of written English. And that's where the problem comes in when they start messing around with your text. That you have to accept yeah. it and work with it. Yeah. What is it like when you work in heart, Eloise? Um, again, my, my experience has, has been polar opposite, uh, depending on where I've worked. The, the high tech company I was at previously being a staff of uh, almost 100, um, mostly native Israelis, um, all meetings took place in Hebrew. Um, but everything else was in English. All internal communications, emails were in English. Obviously the content we were producing was in English. Um, same at the Technion, uh, meetings, especially with the professors and academics when we would, you know, were all in Hebrew. Um, and I, unlike Ilana, I cannot say that I'm, <laughs> I'm fluent. Um, I can hold my own in a conversation, but, um, when native uh, Hebrew speakers uh, start speaking really fast, which is mostly how they speak, um, I, I, I sometimes tend to, to lose track of the conversation. Um, 
the company I'm at now, um, we're about a 50-50 mix of native English speakers and native Israelis or native Hebrew speakers. Um, so, you know, sometimes we'll be chit-chatting around the lunch table in, in Hebrew, but 90% of our conversation is in English. Um, and of course, all, all internal communications are also in English. Um, but you can definitely get away, especially as a, as a new uh, Ole or Ola, um, with no Hebrew. Um, you're essentially not being employed for your Hebrew skills. You're being employed for your first language, uh, English skills and uh, language. Um, and nowadays, most high-tech companies, the, the, the Israelis that are employed there speak a very good level of English. So it's, it's quite doable not to have any Hebrew. What would you do in a, in a meeting when, like you say, everyone's speaking Hebrew though? <laughs> so, conducted in Hebrew. Yeah, um, we almost always had some PowerPoint presentation playing in the background. So I was able to go back and refer to things later on that I perhaps had missed. Um, I also made notes of Hebrew words that I was unfamiliar with or had never heard before. I always had, we all had notebooks in these meetings. Um, and every now and then I'd jot something down and then I'd go to a fellow staff member afterwards and say, what was this or what did that mean? Or what was this? Um, uh, oftentimes I wrote down something that was like absolute gibberish because I hadn't really, <laughs> I hadn't gotten the word right. But, um, you know, with my experience has been that in general in the work environment, uh, people are very open to being asked questions and, and to being helpful and to giving some guidance. And if there's something I've missed or something that I haven't understood, it's uh, never been an issue to ask. And nine times out of 10, I've actually had a staff member come to me and say, did you get everything? Did you follow? Do you have any questions? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and what about age? Is age uh, a problem? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're on well, overhead. Yeah. Um, that's another positive about being a freelance. Uh, sometimes I've, I've gone to, I've dabbled with the idea of being in house and I've gone to interviews and I've never really felt comfortable in those environments. Normally, and it's the kind of environment where your Tel Aviv is bringing their dog to work and there's a cereal machine and, um, you know, it's very young, uh, 20, 30-ish, and uh, that's not for me. So I, I felt that as a freelance, I could be any age. Well, now on Zoom, it's changed a bit. Um, so I think freelancing your age really isn't a factor, whereas in-house, Eloise, what, what do you say? I imagine it would be. Um, look, I can, I can say, um, not that I'm glad to, but I, I can say that <laughs> where I am working currently, I am one of the eldest <laughs> members of staff. Um, even the CEO is younger than me, which is horrifying. Um, but uh, people, people often usually peg my age um, a fair bit younger than I actually am, which I always joke with people, I hope is a reflection of my good looks and not my maturity level. Um, but I find, you know, the, the, the environment is definitely much younger and much, uh, you know, more hipster like uh, in the office I'm working in at the moment. Um, but uh, I've never had an experience to date and I hope I never will where age has played a part in my uh, ability to get a job or not get a job. Um, I think it's more, for me anyway, it has boiled down more to experience. Um, when you make Aliyah, and again, this is just my personal experience, um, you know, you're pretty much wiping the slate clean. Whatever you've done in the past to build your career or whatever career you've established or whatever work experience you have, um, as phenomenal as it may be, um, 
is almost irrelevant because you know the Israeli job market just doesn't work that way. They want to know what you've done in Israel and what you can show here. And like Yelena mentioned earlier, your portfolio and show me what you've done and show me and show me and show me. Um, so yeah, age, age. No, I think age very much in today's world is more of a is more a state of mind. And if if you you know are willing to be a little bit flexible and, and try something new, then I think you can work anywhere. Okay, thank you. Um, what would be the range of salaries people can expect? Maybe start with salaries. What would, what is it like? In, in the high tech where you work? Um, full time content writers earn between 15 to 20,000 shekels plus a month. Um, again, it very much depends on the company you're working for. Um, it is, as uh, Ilana pointed out earlier, a, a very um, sought after. Uh, job at the moment. There are a lot of companies looking for for uh, content writers. Um, I've been approached several times on LinkedIn by other companies that have stumbled across my profile and, you know, wanted to engage with me. Um, fortunately, I'm very happy where I am right now. So unless they offered me the sun, moon and stars, I, I wouldn't really move at this point. But um, yeah, you, you're looking at about uh, 15 to 20,000 shekels a month starting, um, bearing in mind that with that comes the expectation of a minimum nine hour workday. So while I have the flexibility of working from home um, and I don't have to work nine hours straight, I do have to work nine hours a day. How is it in freelancing, uh, Ilana? That must be a challenge to get money um, in. Yeah. Well, actually, it's interesting because there are groups on Facebook for freelance writers in Israel. And uh, one of the most common questions is, uh, what can I um, ask? You know, what, what, how should I quote for this and this and this work? And nobody really wants to say, which is frustrating that I want to tell you. Well, I can tell you that uh, someone who's starting out should probably charge 150 shekels per hour of their work, or uh, that's a kind of starting rate and it can go up depending on your experience. Um, that's a kind of base. And, or you can charge per word. Uh, so I normally charge, well, depends what it is. Can be 500 shekels for 500 words. Uh, um, yeah, it's not easy to know what to quote, but is yeah, what it is. It's better than journalism. Is it? Oh, a thousand times. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you both very much. I'm looking at some questions that have been written down in the chat. So we address the average salary. Is it necessary to know HTML and CSS? I think we actually spoke about it, but do either of you feel you need to actually understand no. HTML and CSS at all? No. Um, no. HTML specifically seems to be a, 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 a slowly dying um, area. Um, my experience personally um, has been that most high tech companies today work with content management systems. In a lot of cases, they're proprietary, meaning they've been built in house by developers employed by the high tech company. And they are tailored to what that company is doing. Um, so where I am now, for example, we work with various CMSs, depending on what website I'm writing for on any particular day, but everything is, is already set on the CMS. So I don't need to fiddle with formatting or codes or any nonsense like that. I just open the CMS, I type in my text, I save it and 
you know, the genius qualities that the developers have given to it does everything else. And it's a fantastic way to work. And I, I, I do find, I have found, should I say, that um, most companies in Israel are, are using this now. So, you know, it's something you, as an in-house writer, you take, you most often learn on the job because every company is using its own range of CMSs, but they are extremely user-friendly and you do not need to know HTML. Okay. Um, what examples of CMS, which is best? If there's any specific one you're saying, basically each company has their own. So, I mean, Ilana, how do you work? Do you, do you just send text? Word. Or? No, Word. Just in Word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if you're 60 and starting out, definitely a challenge. I'm not sure if this is a question or a statement. Um, do either of you want to comment on that? Depends on the back, what background is this person coming from? Okay. Um, yeah. If they have any experience or background with marketing writing, it would be easier than if they were just starting out with no background whatsoever. Is that what you're saying? Probably, yeah. Well, they'd have to, uh, you know, brush up on their, do one of these courses, see how it goes mm -hmm. from there. Okay. Um, I think the problem is there. Probably oh, they should freelance. Probably freelancing would be easier for them. But yeah, I would have to agree. Um, there's also a question, can Eloise perhaps give our CV to her HR? <laughs> With pleasure. <laughs> Send them to me, I will hand them, I will hand them over. I make no promises, once you, but no problem. Once you, do, once you do your LinkedIn profile, a lot of HR companies will be in touch with you. That, no that's, short that's actually an excellent tip. In Israel, Companies hire using LinkedIn and social media in general. So a LinkedIn profile, a good one, um, is always a very good idea. If you need any help with that, um, I actually uh, conducted a two-part webinar on LinkedIn, how to build your LinkedIn profile. We're happy to send you the recording of, uh, of that two-part webinar. And if you need any additional assistance after that, I'm happy to meet with you one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom and, and help with that. So that's an excellent tip. Thank you, Ilana. Yeah. I just want to say that Michal helped get one of my first clients and uh, also taught me. I attended the LinkedIn. Um, uh, what, and it was in person, the LinkedIn seminar, and yeah. it was very, it was very it useful. Was and Michal helped COVID. me with my CV. CV is an interesting point. Didn't you have something to say about CVs, Eloise? That were oh, different. Yeah. Yes. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, the one thing I noticed, well, that struck me as very odd um, from the day I arrived in Israel, is that companies typically have the expectation of a one-page CV, um, which was an absolute first for me, and trying to condense everything I felt potential employers needed to know about me and my uh, um, employment history into one page seemed completely impossible. Um, I ended up actually, which is horrible to admit as a content writer, but I will say it, I ended up uh, actually paying someone, a professional in Israel to help me with my CV because I just could not get my head around how to <laughs> take everything I'd done and put it onto one page. Um, for me, that was a uh, very worthwhile investment and not a very expensive one, but it, it definitely helped me. Um, so just be prepared if you are going to look for a full-time job, um, you're going to need to somehow get your CV onto one page. And a freelance job. Mm. You, you send in your CV. Correct. Well, nowadays you don't need to pay. Um, did you have your, your CV improved? Uh, Yael and I will help you with that as well. Um, and there is one final question that we'll take is, can you 
do content writing for initially companies virtually from South Africa until you manage to make a leap? Um, oh, that's a tough one. Um, I, I would be leaning towards saying generally no um, for several reasons. One, the Israeli market as a whole, Israeli job market, sorry, as a whole is extremely competitive. Um, and most companies have several interview stages before you're actually hired. Um, and I can't say I know of any offhand that would hire someone virtually. They would, you know, want to meet you and assess your, uh, your personality and, and all sorts of things like that to see if you fit the, the environment of the company you'll be working for. And that's a very hard thing to establish um, virtually. So unless you already know someone and maybe have uh, a connection, I think that could be difficult. Um, Ilana, would you say it would be easier if you were freelancing from overseas? It, it sounds like it should be, but I have to say that um, I worked for I worked for quite a few companies that during Corona were Hyuni were um, what do you call it uh, in English were able to keep their in-house staff at at their offices because they were in medical devices etc. And so I had a sorry. They were considered essential employees. Essential, yeah, absolutely. They were essential. So I had a lot of in-person meetings during Corona. Um, and I, I like to go into the office. I've, sometimes I need to understand. I'm writing about, um, say, for example, uh, medical device company. So they bring me in to actually show me the devices and teach me how they operate so that I can write about them or see the, if I'm writing about a company um, and I need to learn about something about their location, their warehouse, I have to go there. So okay, I'm often, so, so uh, I think it would be rather difficult. difficult. Maybe if you were freelance, if you were freelancing for a nonprofit, I, I don't know, I can't say. Um, okay. But it's, it's mm -hmm. you should just give it a try. That's what I would say. That's Maybe they think advice. they can pay you less due to the exchange rate. Okay. Um, right, someone asked again about courses. I think um, Ilana mentioned the Udemy and Eloise mentioned the Google courses. I just want to say something about courses. The problem with most of these courses is that there's no practical work. It's um, no one's going to give you feedback. Even when I did an in-person course once in Tel Aviv, there was no practical. So basically I had to learn on the job. That's a flaw. It would be so nice to be able to, to get uh, professional feedback while you're learning. Yeah. You know, especially in a, in a country like Israel, which is uh, not called the startup nation for no reason, um, companies are so specialized and have their own niches. And most of them, from my experience, have had very particular requirements for their content. Um, and a lot of, you know, so much of it is based on their target markets, the countries they're marketing themselves in, what they're marketing, of course, what they're selling. Um, so it's not really something you can actually learn pre-employment. Um, being a good writer is, is something that I think a lot of people either are or aren't. Um, and in many ways, it's, it's quite a difficult to learn and once you've got a handle on how one company does it you 
switch jobs and now you're in a com another company that does it completely differently with completely different expectations and requirements. So it's a lot of it has to do with flexibility and adaptability and just the willingness to learn on the go. Now, when you're writing for the North American market, you have to write in Americanese. You, you, uh, you have to change yeah. the lingo. I learned a lot of words, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the whole new vocabulary. Language. Yes. Different. Okay. Okay. okay we'll take really, I just want to say, say what's something fun. What I love to see is my work translated into other languages like Vietnamese or Russian, and sometimes even Hebrew. They'll use the English content for the translation. It's very rewarding. Okay. Um, there's one last question that we'll take. Was a law background at all especially appreciated, Louise? Um. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I can't say... Uh, Lawyers generally have very, <laughs> seem to have very good reputations, um, both uh, in Israel and in South Africa. Um, I think what it did show is that I had, you know, a brain um, and uh, had an education and I could write. Um, I have in, in, in certain circumstances been asked for a legal opinion on something that's been written or an aspect of something that's been written in one of the companies I've worked in here uh, in Israel. But um, overall, you know, Israeli law and South African law are so vastly different that, you know, there is no, <laughs> no similarities at all. Um, so no, not really, other than from the ability to write contracts. I think if someone's got a profession, then they could direct their job search to startups in that field. Like if you, um, if you, if it's agri tech or it's uh, food tech, or uh, um, I saw somebody's a social worker. Um, perhaps you could do social media for a nonprofit. Uh, you know, use your, use your background uh, to your advantage. You're a native English speaker and you have a background in a certain area. So you have something to offer uh, startups in, in your particular field. That's very good advice. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, that was very interesting for both of you. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We are uh, rounding up uh, our hour-long uh, webinar. Um, we will be sending out uh, the emails of both uh, Eloise and Ilana, and uh, you'll be able to ask them the questions uh, directly. We are also recording this webinar, so anyone who missed the beginning or the middle or whatever in a few days will be able to send it out. Uh, please be in touch with us regarding any issues that, uh, you know, what Michal mentioned, LinkedIn, CV, these are things that we can definitely help you for free if you want to upgrade or sort of retarget them. Um, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, wishing you all a good night, both in South Africa and uh, in Israel, and uh, hope to be in touch with you thank soon. You thank you, Eloise and Ilana. It was really, really interesting. Thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Shana Tova.